Aussies continue to grapple with stubbornly high costs of living. And uh, joining me now live is Liberal MP Aaron Violi. Hi there, Aaron. Thanks for your time today. Now, I know that because of your tech background, you have uh, you know, proposed using technology to raise productivity, which would help to bring down costs of living. Do you want to shed some light on that? Yeah, absolutely. It's great to be with you. And it's really important we look at technology, particularly uh, artificial intelligence and AI. Um, as we've seen in the last 10 to 15 years, the workforce has really shifted from you know, that stronger manufacturing output, which is quite easy in a way to drive productivity. You invest in capital and machinery. But as we move to a service economy, our technology and AI is going to play a huge role in driving that productivity growth, which is so crucial for the economy. Uh, if we want to have strong and the uh, you know, Productivity Commission talk about this a lot. You know, having strong real wages growth that's sustainable needs to be complemented with productivity growth to ensure that inflation in the short term, like we're seeing at the moment, but also in the long term, is within that 2 to 3% band. And it was really disappointing to see the government's AI paper focused on the risks of AI and didn't look at the productivity and economic upside. We've got to do both. We've got to allow for the risks but also understand there's significant opportunities, particularly in a cost of living crisis, to bring inflation down to a sustainable level. Why do you think that is so? Lack of understanding or, you know, it doesn't make for good spin? Oh, it definitely doesn't make for good spin. We, we've seen consistently with this government, uh, well, they haven't been focused on the economy and cost of living. That's the first thing we've seen. We saw that um, you know, for the first 18 months of this government, the Prime Minister was distracted. Since then, he's backflipped and broken his word on the stage three tax cuts. And we've seen for the last two weeks, and realistically since the budget, the Prime Minister and other senior ministers have been focused on internal matters, internal Labor Party um, matters, and, and Senator Payman uh, is at, you know, at the front of that. And that's what their focus has been on. There's also a real lack of understanding about what the modern economy is about. And that was shown... Uh, through the Prime Minister's decision when he formed a government not to have a minister for the digital economy. Uh, the previous coalition government had a minister for the digital economy, that was Senator Jane Hume, who put in a roadmap to 2030 to drive uh, digital growth, to drive productivity, to drive economic growth. It's not a focus of this government, and unfortunately, Australians are paying the price every day. Every time they go to the grocery store, every time they put petrol into the car or an electricity or power bill comes through, it's because this government isn't focused on the cost of living crisis or the digital economy and the upside opportunities for all Australians. But do you think voters really understand what productivity increases can bring? Um, you know, retailers, attacking retailers is very easy and easy to understand. Oh, there's no doubt there's different levels of understanding within the community about what productivity means, um, what cost of living means. What you know, everyone in my community knows is that every time they go to the shops, they're paying more. But they also understand, and a lot, we've got to give community credit, many people do work in businesses, small businesses, family businesses, trades in, in my community. They know that if everything goes up and it's not offset by productivity gains, it will cost them more. So we should never shortchange the Australian people so they understand the importance of it. They don't have, the, you know, in my community, you know, we're so busy working and putting food on the table, taking the kids to sport, that we don't have a lot of time to sit and, you know, read economic journals and things like that. But they understand a government that's focused on economic growth and productivity, and they see one that's distracted and not prepared to make the tough decisions to continue to drive economic growth and productivity for our country. Can you give us an example, Aaron, of how, for example, artificial intelligence can increase productivity in areas like yeah. retail? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, well, retail is an interesting example. I'll give two quick examples. One, retail, but I'll also talk to health and the service economy because we've seen a big increase in services um, jobs in our, as a percentage of our market. But if you look at a Woolworths or a Coles, and I worked in this industry um, for, for 10 plus years, by having, you know, using things like data and shopping habits, the way people shop, you can actually make sure that when you're laying out stores, it's a little bit more productive um, for people to, to, to shop, but also importantly for those stores, having those maps makes it easier for their staff to fill the shelves, to pick the orders for online orders which have grown. So if suddenly you're able to pick more online orders in a quicker time that because of technology, 
that's an example of productivity output at a grocery level. And it goes all the way through the supply chain for a Woolworths or Coles. But an example I like to talk about a lot is Harrison AI. It's a company that's using artificial intelligence to scan pathology reports and to help a pathologist identify uh, risks in scans like lung scans, things like that. And it does two important things. It allows them to, the AI triages and highlights the most urgent scans that need to be looked at. And it also highlights areas on that scan that it sees of concern. But really importantly, it doesn't take the person out of the process. So once it's done all of that, uh, a pathologist, the right person, an expert will review that scan, confirm what the AI has suggested and put a sense check on that. And what that's doing is allowing a human to get through a lot more scans in the eight hours that they work in a day to then hopefully prevent some of those medical episodes from developing. And sometimes we've seen lots of examples where AI has picked up uh, anomalies within a scan that the human eye wouldn't have seen. So that's an example in health and in, I guess, that services industry where artificial intelligence can play a role. But the really important part is we always need to have a human within that process. It should not be a, a process that doesn't have that human eye, that human sense checking in, and that provides a bit of safety and redundancy in the system as well.